Good evening and welcome to the live Q&A with Julian, Jill and Tony. My name is Marietta Evans. I'm delighted to have been asked to host this online event tonight. I'm, as you can see, live streaming from my bedroom in Eiffel. I would love to know from where are you watching us this evening? So please do leave a comment to say hi and to let us know from where are you joining us this evening. This, now this is the moment that all of you have been waiting for. Now is when you can send a comment, just write a comment underneath the video and say, uh, write a comment uh, asking a question for Tony, for Jill, for Julian, or just write a comment to let us know what do you think of the panel that we just watched or if you have any feedback or, or just to say hello. Uh, Julian, um, well, actually, if you just join us, let me introduce our guest properly. Julian is the author of Irreplaceable, The Fight to Save Our Wild Places, a book that many of you have read, and if not, a book that I'm very, very happy to recommend. And we have Jill <laughs> showing you the video. Uh, Dr. Tony Whitbread is the president of Sussex Wildlife Trust, and Dr. Jill Sutcliffe is an ecologist and and environmental scientist. Uh, the three of them, Jill, Tony and Julian, are delighted to be here today to answer live all of your questions about nature, ecology, biodiversity, the environment. So please do keep sending your questions because now is when you can participate live with us. However, if you have any specific question about the upcoming planning application, uh, do get in touch with the Stop the Clay Pit uh, group and I'm showing on a screen how you can get in touch with them is either join at stoptheclaypit.org or you can visit the website stoptheclaypit.org. So any question about the planning application, do feel free to get in touch with the campaign group and let's talk about the beautiful woods this evening. The first question is from me and it's for the three of them. And the question is, would you like to see a video with some of the most beautiful photos that the uh, people in the community have taken of our woods? Absolutely. Yes. Let's have a look at the comments that are coming up already from the audience watching live. Uh, we've got Wayne Watson from Luxwood. Hello, good evening, Wayne. We've got Karen also from Luxwood. We've got uh, Gareth, who, uh, well, is, my, is more than my neighbor. He's also from Eiffel. And we have a question for Julian, and it's from Jill Davis. Can I ask Julian, as someone who lives in mainland Europe, do governments have a different attitude to preserving woodland there compared with the UK? Excellent question, Jill, and, and thank you for asking it. Um, yes, and sometimes that's a more positive 
uh, legislative approach than in Britain, and sometimes it's worse. Uh, right now, you, we're looking at somewhere like Romania, for example. Romania is home to some of the most fantastic woodlands that you can find anywhere in Europe, and they're being truly, truly decimated, largely because of a sort of logging mafia. Um, and that goes against sort of EU Natura 2000 regulations. But you have also countries like Greece, where I live, and there's a much more sympathetic approach to woodlands. You know, we, most of our firewood comes from the local woods here. And the woodcutters themselves are extraordinarily meticulous about how wood is removed from it. And rarely do I ever see more than a single tree removed out of a stand of 30 or 40. Now, some parts of Greece, it's not as good as that. Um, but there is a recognition, I think, that these are resources that have sustained European nations and cultures and peoples and communities for such a long time. And by and large, there does seem to be a, a more positive, I suppose, connection with woodlands in terms of how their management works. But that's not completely true right across the, the, the continent. Uh, we have a comment from I, from Ian. I think he was talking about the Wandering in the Woods, which is the, the video that we just premiered before this Q&A. And Ian says that was great. Learned a lot. I learned a lot as well. Uh, how do we best support the campaign to stop the destruction of these wonderful woods? Uh, uh, Jill, do you want to take this one? Uh, yes, of course. Um, it's lovely to have so many people enthusiastic and using the woods, particularly in this time of COVID, I think people have recognised the value even more. Um, so the best thing is to join the local uh, residents who have formed a campaign, of course, locks would stop the clay pit. Uh, another thing is to get involved as a volunteer helping in your local woods and or join the Sussex Wildlife Trust that does a lot to protect. We're the second highest wooded county in Britain, so it's worth looking after them. Can I, can I just add a bit oh, there as well? Uh, yeah, that is the um, uh, woodlands in this country, believe it or not, are actually the best protected habitat that we have. They're the best, um, best protected in terms of policy and legislation. So it's very well protected. And I think what you can do is actually remind the people that are supposed to be protecting woodlands that that is the case. We ought to be reminding our local authorities, reminding people like the Forestry Commission, reminding our MPs, reminding our councillors that actually there are strong policies protecting our woodlands. Let's live by them. Let's not just forget them. Mm. And if I could just very, very briefly add on to that, you know, that was one of the kind of themes that I looked at in my book whilst spending time with communities in various parts of the world, but a lot of communities in Britain. And those campaigns to protect woodlands that were threatened, those campaigns that were strongest, that were perhaps most durable, were the ones that operated on the broadest spectrum possible. They brought in people who aren't necessarily politically aligned within the community, who don't necessarily share a great deal in common, other than their love and profound sense of connection and attachments to, the, to those woods themselves. And to really move on a broad front, to really try and uh, elevate those kind of connections, whether it be through uh, petitions, whether it be through events like this, whether it be through getting children involved. And some of the the most successful campaigns that I charted were actually started by, by young people, one a 15-year-old girl in Staffordshire who ultimately went on to save her threatened woodland because she got so active and she galvanized this extraordinary groundswell of support that was already there in the community. It simply needed tapping into. Can I, can I just add as well that doing these sorts of things and keeping people informed about what's happening also takes money. So if you're thinking of what to do at Easter, you could not buy all the Easter eggs, but put a bit of money into the campaign. Thank you. I would like to remind everybody watching us live that this is now your opportunity to send questions, write a comment with a question for Tony, Julian and Jill, because we are live, we're live right now uh, here with you to answer all of your questions. So keep them coming. I've got a very good question from Toby and it's a very good question as we are now celebrating this week's uh, Sussex Spring Watch. And Toby says, I'm desperate to see one of 
um, that with peakers can always hear them, but can never see one. What am I doing wrong? What is Toby doing wrong? Wow, I think that's an, that's an interesting question because, yes, likewise, you can often hear the woodpeckers. You can hear them drumming. They also make a characteristic call, so you can hear that. But we're talking about birds in woods, and actually, they're not always very easy to see. Um, sometimes you can recognize one good thing to do, I think, is to recognize the shape of the woodpecker in flight because they're a fairly dumpy bird. And sometimes you can see them flying around, and then you get a good view when they settle on a tree. But actually, finding one in the middle of a tree especially when the leaves come out, is actually very difficult. So I'd say get to know what they look like in flight and try to follow them to the tree where they are. If you're really lucky, you may find them in a nest as well. They can make quite a din when they're looking after their chicks later in the year. So you may be able to find them if you follow the, the noise of the chicks crying out for things. <laughs> the, the black and white one is the greater spotted woodpecker and it has some red on it, depending whether it's a male or female. And then the <laughs> green one, which has a yellow neck of uh, nape of the neck, uh, is more often found on grass in fields or in gardens on the ground looking for grubs in the ground. At this time of year I'm lucky because I have a bit of ground and the green woodpecker will come to there but I've also got um, a, a bird feeder and that's where the red the red and black one white black and white with red on it greater wood spotted woodpecker comes and my neighbour was so lucky two years ago she had a feeder up and she had two adults and two young birds on the same. So you have four woodpeckers in one go. So it's also worth looking after feeding your birds. <laughs> uh, Toby, I hope you were taking notes and we look forward to seeing your pictures of woodpeckers very, very soon. Uh, Karen says, I have woodpeckers in my garden. They are so colorful. Uh, Vivian says, is there scientific data to point to happiness levels or other benefits we gain from immersing ourselves in woodland versus, uh, for example, uh, meadows or oceans? What a really beautiful, interesting question. Who wants to take this one? I can take that one if you'd like. There's, yes. uh, I don't know specifically if there's a great deal difference between woodland as opposed to meadows, for example, but there's an enormous amount of data. A lot of it originally came out of Japan. Uh, in which their tradition of for what translates effectively to forest bathing. And the scientific data that emerged out of this practice, which literally translates really to just going for a walk in the woods. It, it, it showed reduced levels of stress. It showed increased memory and focus. Increased, all of these, uh, it lessened um, anxiety disorders. And the evidence was so powerful that the Japanese about 20 years ago actually... Uh, incorporated forest bathing or a walk in the woods into their equivalent of the NHS. This is how powerful a tonic it can be. Um, whether it differs so much from spending time in a meadow, I can't say, but certainly the evidence itself for, for being in a wood is profoundly um, potent. Uh, Tony, is anything you would like to add? Well, just, just to agree, yes. And likewise, I don't know whether there's a difference between the different habitats. Um, I, I just don't know. Maybe the research has been done because one thing that's happened is this research has really built up over the years. Uh, we knew this. Of course, our grandparents knew this. Everybody knows that actually it's good to be out in nature. You feel better. So we knew it anyway, but we couldn't prove it. But now it's being proved. And you can actually do scans of people's brains when they're exposed to pictures of nature and all their, 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 their pleasure sensors light, light up. Uh, there are measurable effects. There are measurable effects on, as, as, as Julian said, on, on stress levels and heartbeats and all those sorts of things. So much so that I think now that that idea from Japan is, is moving into mm -hmm. Britain and there's starting to be things called social prescribing, where a doctor will prescribe a walk in the woods or a walk in the countryside rather than the course of paracetamol. So, so actually using nature for what it should be used for to actually put us back in, in touch with nature and feel better for it. Beautiful. Thank you very much. And, and Vivian, thank you very much for that question. Really beautiful uh, question, really beautiful thought. Uh, Sue, oh, Sue uh, is asking a very, very interesting question. Um, uh, Sue says, I have enjoyed the woodlands for many, many years. Could you help me understand what is described as ancient, ancient woodland and how this compared to a woodland that, in my view, is clearly old and established? Uh, Tony, yeah. would you like to take this one? 
Shall I do that? And I might have to admit to some previous here because actually in, a, in an earlier life, I did the ancient woodland inventory for Sussex. So it was back in the 80s. So a lot of this stuff that's identified is probably my fault. <laughs> but the actual definition... <laughs> The definition of ancient woodland is a woodland, an area that's been under some form of woodland management for at mm -hmm. least 400 years, probably much longer. Uh, but that's where the maps start to become available. So 400 years um, is, is an ancient woodland. Now, the way you can recognize these is because, as I think I mentioned in the, in the, in the, in the video earlier, there are several plants in particular, but also in, mm -hmm. invertebrates and so on, which are very slow to colonize. And so once they're there, they really indicate that they've probably been there for a very long time. So those are called ancient woodland indicators. And it all sounds very grand and so on. But mm. actually, it's, um, it's some very familiar species. You know, the carpets of bluebells that you see? Well, that tends to indicate ancient woodlands. You may get patches in new woodlands, but the carpet's really limited to ancient woodlands. Wooden enemy. Everybody loves a wooded enemy. It's one of our slowest colonized wood colonizing woodland species. So, you, you know, lots of wooden enemy. You often see it on very wet soils. So lots of wooden enemy and you're definitely in an ancient woodland. Uh, you can identify large coppice stools, you know, where a tree has been cut down on a rotation for a very long time. These are ancient features. Also in ancient woodlands, you've got ancient features like boundary banks. There was an ancient trackway I remember us walking through in, in, the, in the wood at Loxwood. Uh, so all these features start to come into play. But also I'd say that I, I said before that the complexity is important. Some parts of woodlands will be relatively new, but that mixture of new and ancient can give great diversity. Uh, I saw some ridge and furrow in the woodland. Well, that's a way of managing a, a, a field. So obviously the wood has come after the field was abandoned and it adds another layer of complexity. So woods are always a lot more complex than we think they are. And simply calling them either ancient or modern really kind of does them, a bit, it does them an injustice. At but I think there's an additional there's an additional point, Tony, about the history. Up until the 400 years ago, 1600, we couldn't take down a whole woodland, and it was at that point that the first plantation was put in at Windsor. And from that moment on, we could have a much more adverse effect on how many trees we could take away. Up until that point, trees largely were, remained in situ or just coppiced or taken down just in small numbers but it was the ability people had to take more dr drastic action and clear a woodland as or replant a whole woodland that, as happened at windsor that led to the idea of it being ancient woodland was my story anyway <laughs> uh, i think it's very interesting tony actually you said that uh bluebells are a sign of ancient woodland because i do seem to remember seeing lots and lots of them in the palinhurst woods and if that is a sign of ancient woodland i mean just i'm just putting two and two together uh heather heather says well said jill give money to the campaign instead of buying easter eggs at that that don't last very long and explain to your children, grandchildren, why you might not be very popular in the short run, but maybe in the long run. Uh, that's a, a bit of a risky, risky business, Heather, but yeah, <laughs> well, well intended thought. <laughs> thank you very much. And thank you for being with us tonight, uh, Heather. Uh, Vivian says, uh, Julian, thank you very much for the feedback and the furthest bathing prescription to get out into our woods. Uh, thank you very much to you, Vivian, for your question. Uh, Quick Kinton uh, says, we have seen small black boxes fixed to trees at low level. What are these for and why are they only in one area? Very good question as well. Thank you very much, Kim. Who wants to take this one? Yep. I, know, I, know, I know Jill would know what that is as well, but I can have a first stab <laughs> if you like. I, I think it's likely that that's a survey system for surveying for dormice. Um, and I guess it might be linked to the information that's required in order to, to put forward the planning application because dormice are protected species. And the way it works, I think, is that those little boxes have probably got sticky tape in them. And the idea is the mouse runs through it and it leaves some of its hair behind. And you can therefore identify the animal from the hair that's left behind. <laughs> so, yes, and so dormice, there are our woodland mouse. They're like almost like miniature miniature squirrels running about in the trees, but they are quite threatened and they're reducing. Uh, we have a reasonable population in Sussex because of all our woods. But one thing I think that's key to point out is that um, they're threatened because we're always um, fragmenting our woodlands. 
you need at least 20 hectares of continuous woodland to support a viable population of dormice. So if you have a 30 hectare wood and you stick a, a, a line through the middle of it and convert it into two 15 hectare woods, you may have the same area of woodland, but it wouldn't support dormice anymore. So it's a kind of classic example of how fragmentation uh, actually causes much bigger effects than we think. And even though we may look at the countryside and think, well, we've got a lot of woodland, it's all still there, we haven't lost very much, this fragmentation and simplification effect can have a big effect on, 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 the, on the populations in the woodland. Thank you very much. Uh, Wayne says, oh, Jill, you wanted to add? Well, I was just going to add the other thing that you see in woods if the surveys are being done are almost like little sleeping bags for dormice uh, stretched across the bow and then they come in and a friend who is a woodland manager at a different wood from Pallinghurst um, was looking out checking his woodland and he thought he'd got a stick sticking out and when he went to touch it it leapt out and it was actually a little dormouse that had got into its sleeping bag. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Wayne says, uh, anecdotally, uh, forest bathing definitely has a positive effect on my family. Uh, here, me too, me too. I, and I think a lot of us watching, uh, well, either watching or talking to you this evening will probably, probably agree. And how lucky we have been to be so close to those woods during lockdown. I mean, I can't say thank you enough to Mother Nature because it uh, has kept me sane. Uh, Tim says, uh, one of the comments made by the developers was that there are no badgers in the woods as badgers don't like to live in clay soil. I'm pretty sure though, uh, have that I have seen badgers under sets. I think you're right, Marietta. Uh, there is evidence of uh, badger holes. You don't often see clearly badgers come out at dusk. They're not very evident and they don't like much human uh, sounds and interference, but they leave their little bristles on any wires or posts or fences and they've certainly been seen. Uh, so beautiful animals. I think Chris Packham did his uh, PhD on them, which is why he raves about them in the New Forest. Um, um, I'm going to continue inviting all of you watching live to comment with uh, any more question that you may have for Tony, Julian or Jill. I'm going to ask a couple of questions that I have been uh, sent by people who could not be live now, but they will be watching later and they wanted to ask a couple of questions. One question I have been sent by a family and their daughter, Sarah, she's 10 years old. She loves the woods, she lives locally and she's got a very, very important question. She wants to know, how do flowers know they have to come up in the spring. How do they know is their time? Ah, oh, well, a good question. That's brilliant. Well, that, the flowers are responding to cues, things they're being told uh, by the environment. And they actually respond to different cues. So do you get different flowers appearing at different times, responding to different cues? Now, some flowers uh, go by day length and some flowers go by, by temperature. Now, where, where I think this shows out quite nicely is, do you know the poem, it's not a flower, it's a tree, but uh, ash before oak, you're in for a soak, oak before ash, you're in for a splash. Yeah. It predicts the weather. Well, that's because the two trees respond to different cues. Now, I think oak, um, ash responds to day length. So it always comes out at the same time of the year. Oak responds to temperature. So it comes out later, and it comes out earlier when the temperature increases. Now, what we're finding is that actually oak is coming out earlier and earlier. So we're much more likely to get a splash, i.e. we're going to have a dry <laughs> summer than we have to get a, a wet summer because the oak is coming out earlier because of climate change, whereas the ash, because the cue it gets is by day length, comes out at roughly the same time every year. Now, there are a lot of other plants which also go by similar clues. It could be day length, it could be temperature, it could be light. Um, but I don't know how they do it. <laughs> <laughs> The other one is the snowdrop, which does come out early. It's that pale white with little green on it, rather fragile looking plant. And it's actually got a hardened head so it can get through snow or ice. So when you see a snowdrop, it's had to really push its way through the uh, frost or ice. And it's specially developed for doing that thing. So although it looks fragile, it's uh, quite strong. 
Uh, Sue says, thank you so much. That is very useful and valuable information. I'm really looking forward to seeing the bluebells in the woods very soon. Uh, where do bluebells come from? Oh, they're, they're native, very strongly native. Uh, I think about half the bluebells in the world are, are in Britain. Uh, they're very much a really? sign of, of a British woodland. Yeah, so the, the carpets oh. of blue, people come from all over the world to see our carpets of bluebells because they're so much a thing of Britain. So, yeah, we take it for granted uh, at our peril, but uh, you know, <laughs> really, really true. Excuse me, Tony. I think we have done Brexit, but they're also in Europe and they're down the Western Atlantic fringe <laughs> of Europe. So we do yeah. have a lot, but we mustn't forget you can see them if you're in France or Italy as well. Not as extensive, I agree, but um, they are an Atlantic species. Mm. Uh, because I did, I didn't um, grow up in in England, as you can tell by my accent, and I was so shocked the first time uh, I spent a spring here. I I couldn't believe the beauty in front of me. It was, it was like it was like something out of a painting or or a wonderland or a paradise. It's really 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 beautiful. We're really really lucky to have this just on our doorstep. Uh, Toby says. There definitely are badgers in. There are definitely badgers in the woods. I can think of at least three sets. Something we were talking about before that. We some of us do believe that there is evidence that there are badgers in our woods near Lockswood. Uh, Sandra says, I live in Lockswood Road. And, well, she's commenting on what we were just talking about. Fantastic. I love when this become a conversation. I live in Lockswood Road and we capture a badger in our garden on, or in our garden on film last week. We are definitely on clay soil. That is so good, Sandra. And if you can rem uh, if you can remember to look for our Facebook page, social media, uh, email address, and you could send us um the film or photo of the badger that you captured in Lux Road. We would love to see that. So please get in touch and send us either either a photo or the film of the badger. We would really, really love to see that. Um Alison says, how do you estimate the age of a tree without obviously cutting it down yeah good question uh, because yeah i suppose as everybody knows if you do cut it down you can count the rings um <laughs> but without being able to do that you can you you, you have to estimate um and one thing i tend to uh, i think kind of works for oak trees is that if you imagine yourself kind of wrapping your arms around oh, the camera's not big enough you're wrapping your arms around a tree <laughs> um, that's roughly a hundred years so actually, if you've got a big tree and it takes, you know, three hugs to get round it, it's possibly 300 years old as a very rough, you know, guy. <laughs> so that gives you an idea. Think of that. Think of that size. Think of that size. Now, think of it when you look at the um, the coppice stalls, you know, the, tr the trees that have been cut down on a short rotation. So there's all sorts of small sprouts. Now, the small ones are probably cut on a fairly short rotation. But now look at the size of the coppice stall that they were growing from and imagine that as the width of the tree. That will give you an idea of the of the age of that coppice stalk. Now, quite often we think of the trees as being very old because we look at them, they're big, we think they're the oldest things in the wood. Usually they're not. Usually it's the coppices and they can they can date back a very long time. And I've just heard, I think it was a wood in East Sussex where they found, I think, a hornbeam, a ring of hornbeam trees, which turn out to be a ring that was a coppice and they're probably well over a thousand years old, possibly much older than that. It could date back to the original hybrid, one individual. So, yeah. Francis Rose, Francis Rose found that on the South Downs. In other words, he'd gone to a tree, and when he looked at it, it had lots of little branches sticking up from it, and the base of the tree or the stool was so round that he worked out that was dated to the Ice Age, and everybody else had just taken it for granted. Oh, look, there's a coppice tree. But it was he who realised that it was that old and, and by the size of it. So that's how you do it. You, oops, that's how you do it. The other way is to take um, a measurement of, with your tape measure round of diameter and work out what the height of the tree is at an angle. And you can work out the uh, size of the tree then as well. And the age, sorry. And you think of the the ecosystems that might be harbored by those really really ancient ancient trees you know i was in um california a few years ago in an ancient redwood 
Grove, just to swap over continents briefly. And it was a sort of cathedral grove of 1,000-year-old redwoods. And what was so astonishing about them wasn't just their presence, this almost sentient antique atmosphere of being there, but what I later discovered that scientists had only started teasing out in recent decades, that there is a whole other world at the top of the oldest, oldest, old growth redwoods that nobody knew about. There are earthworms living up there in the nooks and crooks of the highest, highest branches where airborne soil has gathered and collected over the course of centuries. There is a whole other gallery of basically bonsai-like miniatures of Douglas firs and hemlocks that are really stunted, but actual trees growing from the trees, different species. Um, salamanders were living up there that nobody had even discovered before. <laughs> and an aquatic crustacean called the copepod, which you usually find in, in the ocean and gravel beds, were actually found living in these extraordinary bowls of water in the highest parts of the redwood canopy. So when we start talking about ancient trees, we're not just talking about age, but we're also sometimes talking literally about whole other ecosystems that might have required that length of time, that extraordinary antiquity to establish itself. Uh, Julian, you just remind, reminded me of when scientists like dive in and go deep, deep in the ocean and discover fish that we have never seen before. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> I, I was worried whether the earthworms have their own step ladders. <laughs> yeah. I've not I, I seen have them. no idea how they get there. <laughs> I truly don't. But they, 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 they live in the accumulated soil. You know, hundreds and hundreds of feet off the ground, which is astonishing. There's one, there's one of the very small glass frogs in Costa Rica lays its spawn um, up the top of the trees, and then it has to climb the tree to go and feed its young every day. And, wow. I mean, we're talking 60, 90 feet. And this little frog, which is hardly bigger than my thumbnail, is yeah. travelling yeah. up and down this tree daily to look after its young. You know, when we talk about the wonders of woods, the worlds inside woods, you know, we're really, this is what it's all about as well. You know, these extraordinary other lives, you know, that dwell there, that inhabit these remarkable places, whether they're individual trees or whether they're a whole community, a whole encircling forest community of trees. And we've got another question from Wayne. What is the most common variety of bluebell in Sussex? Well, we, we only have one species of bluebell, the, the, the British bluebell. I think it's Hyacinthoides non scripta is the, the Latin name, but it seems to change quite often. So we have the one species of, of native bluebell. But we also get the Spanish bluebell, uh, which has been, there, there have been worries about the, the Spanish bluebell kind of coming in and taking over our woods and hybridizing with our species. Um, there was a great worry a few years ago. I think there's some recent evidence which shows that the, the native bluebell is at a genetic advantage in this country. Over, over the Spanish one. So we're slightly less worried now, but um, it does actually make the point that, you know, invasive species can actually simplify our, our landscape as well if we're not careful. So it's not just direct damage that mm -hmm. we do. Getting the wrong species in the wrong place could actually cause even more damage. So now there's one species of native mm -hmm. bluebell in this country. The other one you tend to come across, it's bigger, it's more showy. The, 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 the flowers kind of nod in all directions rather than in one direction. It hasn't got any scent. That's the Spanish bluebell. Uh, Sandra says, uh, donation in place of Easter eggs. How we donate to the campaign, Jill? Uh, if you visit the Loxwood Facebook page, there's a donation uh, click on there. Thank you. And, and also on the website. And what I'm going to do, Sandra, is when I finish the live, the last thing you will see is I'm going to put again a screen with both the link to the uh, website of their campaign group and also the, the email address. And I'm sure they will be very, very happy uh, to hear from you if you want to support the Stop the Luxwood Clay Pit campaign group. Uh, Vivian, how much of the Luxwood Woods is under threat from this clay extraction and when is the deadline for the for the consultation? Well, uh, Vivian, the application has not gone in yet. Uh, so once the uh, application goes in, 
people will be able to comment. And if you have any more questions regarding the uh, the application, again, please get in touch with the, with the campaign group uh, who will be really, really happy to, to talk to you. Uh, Jill says, if the panel had to pick their favorite woodland plant for or animal, oh, that's uh, who do you love the most, mommy or daddy, tricky one. Uh, what is your favorite woodland plant or animal? What would it be? Right, okay, so I'm going to be a bit to... Sorry, Tony's going. No, I was, I was just going to say I was going to be, be a bit aberrant and say I, I, I don't think like that. I think about living systems, and so I haven't actually got a, 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 a favourite. Um, I like going into the wood and just reading the whole wood. So I think uh, I, I rebel a little bit about uh, a breaking it down into its component parts. However, there's some pretty nice stuff out there, so I think it's perfectly reasonable to have your own, your own personal favourite. But I'd say read the whole wood. Read the whole system rather than looking at the individual parts. So I'll um, I'll choose one, even though it's impossible <laughs> to choose one. But given that given that I, I don't currently live in, in I haven't lived in Britain for for some time now, so I'm going to bring a species from this corner of the continent that you don't have in Britain. Okay. And this is just going to be today's choice because I saw one yesterday. <laughs> on walk. Tomorrow, if you ask this question, I would have a different answer, but it would be the black woodpecker. Um, Europe's largest woodpecker species. And, you know, it's, it's, it literally is about that, that big. And it's solid black, it's midnight black, except for this great scarlet crown. And, they 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 nest high up in the the mountain forests behind my house here in silver fir forests and they're very very difficult to see up there uh you're looking at a uh, at a at a ecosystem that's really really tangled a lot of its old growth it's surrounded by these spires of beech trees so you might just occasionally get a glimpse but often in the autumn and the winter which is why i saw one yesterday they descend down to the lowland valleys and that we've got a little ribbon of old willow trees that runs up behind our house. And the black woodpecker, somebody asked the question about a woodpecker, I probably wouldn't have seen this one either, but the black woodpecker has this extraordinary call. It's effectively a cry. I'm, I'm not gonna, I'm tempted to try it, but it's basically, <laughs> I'll go on, I'll do this. It's a sort of, oh, and it drops right away, but it's much higher pitched than that. Again, again, please, again, please. Ooh, but really high pitch. And it carries right across the valley. And the second I hear that, I know to look around. And I, uh, I can't remember if it was Toby who asked the question, but somebody asked the question about woodpeckers. Invariably, I don't find it. But sometimes, as yesterday, I caught a glimpse of it, and it rode up a tree, up a, a limb of willow. And, um, and there was that great scarlet crown. And it's got a beak that is so long, many, most woodpecker species, their, their, their um, tongues actually wrap around the back of the skull. And that's how they are able to extend them so far in. And what the black woodpecker feeds on is carpenter ants so deep into these willow trees that if you can imagine taking an ax and working for about an hour on a willow trunk, that's the kind of groove that you would get if you were a black woodpecker. It is relentless, hammering away, <laughs> chipping out. You've got these great mounds of wood chips at the bottom, and then it literally licks out the carpenter ants and then goes off on its way. Well, I'm going to have to uh, stand up for plants here because, of course, flowering plants underlie everything else that's going on in the woodland. So at this time of year, not deep in the woodland, but often along the path edge, We've got the primroses out, and I love the smell of wild garlic. And it shouldn't be long before we've got wild garlic out. I think the uh, chef will get to it first, but I'm a bit <laughs> gut I might be gutted because I was like, oh, I can answer that question as well. And I was going to say, if it's to see bluebells, if it is to eat wild garlic, because it's great for cooking, especially with risotto, risotto and asparagus, um, risotto, wild garlic. And asparagus, asparagus risotto is one of my favorite dishes in the spring. Uh, uh, Alison says, thanks, Dr. Tony. I'll be found tree hugging from now on. <laughs> well, we want to see pictures of that as well, Alison. Yeah. Uh, I would like to uh, thank Vivian for 
for question earlier about how much of the woodland is under threat from the uh, clay application when the application goes in. We are respecting the application in the spring. Uh, we're very sorry, this is not the kind of question we are prepared to answer today in this uh, panel about ecology. However, this is a very good question, is something that the campaign group is actively looking into. So please do get in touch with the Stop the Looks with Clay campaign group because they are looking into it and they will be very, very happy to talk to you about it. Good question, Vivian. Um, thank you very much for asking. Uh, Heather, uh, Heather says, if you see me hugging trees in the woods, don't worry about me. I'm just guessing it's age. Of course, because Tony has told us that's how we can guess the age of a tree without having to cut it. Uh, Richard says, we live on... I'm very sorry, I'm really bad at pronouncing this word. Uh, drunk, drunk week lane, just to the south, and have badger sets in our woods, and we are on clay. Again, uh, thank you very much, Richard, because that was one of the big questions today. Have we got badgers in the area? And as we can see, it's just a fact, people are saying, yes, we have them. So thank you very much, Richard. Um, uh, Toby says, hurrah for the British bluebell, it's really beautiful. And I didn't know we had something called the Spanish uh, bluebell. Uh, Tony, I grew up in Spain and I had never heard of it. Uh, so I'll have to Google that. Um, Wayne says, uh, thanks, doctor, doctor with bread, that is a relief. Uh, <laughs> Uh, Vivian says thank you. Well, thank you very much for your question, Vivian. We really, really like that this has been a very interactive session. Uh, Wild Garley, what a lovely thought, Dr. Jill and Mariette. So, well, I'm hungry and I haven't had dinner yet. Um, I, I'm not going to use that as an excuse to stop the conversation now, but I am getting really hungry thinking of Wild Garlic. I have another a couple of questions from people who are not uh, watching on Facebook. And, uh, Martin from Alfold says, uh, flower season is upon us, but so is the bee and wasp season. I do respect bees because I know why we need them, but what about wasps? Do they really fulfill a role in nature? Or is it only to scare Martin and me? I was on mute. Yes, I've got to speak up for wasps. Um, wasps, <laughs> wasps are, inc are incredible predators. They, they spend most of their time through the year actually eating all sorts of things that would otherwise cause all sorts of damage to gardens. So then most of the year they are gardeners' friends. I think there was uh, somebody worked out, is it about half a tonne a year from one wasp nest is what's actually harvested from some of the... Um, you know, the, the creepy crawlies that would be otherwise be eating your crops. So wasps do a great deal when it comes to um, reducing the pest load in an area. Yes, later in the year, they do get a bit silly. They do love what they want, the kind of sweetness, and they go for our fruit as well. So you may have to do something about it. But um, yeah, I mean, they're, they're part of the great rich tapestry that makes our biodiversity. And uh, so, so yeah, yeah, I, I, I quite like wasps, um, even though they hurt when they sting me. <laughs> And bear in mind, that's only one species. There's a whole mass of different species of wasp. Uh, and most of them are carnivores that are eating things that we'd rather weren't too pop too too common in the, in the landscape. So so there's a lot of wasps out there. Jill or Julian, anything else in defense of wasps? I think Tony said it all, actually. But it, it is a bit annoying when you're out with a picnic and suddenly get surrounded by wasps. Uh, I wish they had a sort of more responsive reaction to us saying <laughs> us off, and then that would be fine. Uh, well, talking about animals that we are scared of, I do have a final question again from me before we wrap this up. Uh, it's kind of a double question. Um, and the thing is, as you can guess, I didn't grow up in England. When my husband proposed, and with that proposition of marriage, uh, the thought of moving to England was part of the plan. He told me two things. He promised me that you can have indeed hot, nice summer days in the English summer. And because he knows that I have a terrible phobia to snakes, he promised me when we got engaged, and I said yes, he promised me that there are no snakes or anything 
similar to a snake in England. Now, we have had indeed very, very lovely summers for the last three years. I don't know whether that is lucky or is the effect of uh, the climate change. So that is for you to, to discuss and decide. And the second part of the question, because now I'm always, always scared when I go into the woods in spring and summer, like with my boots up to here, even when it's really, really hot. Is it true what my husband said, that there are no snakes in England? Discuss. Not, none to really worry about. Maybe I'll put it. <laughs> uh, we, do, we, do, we do have a few snakes, yeah, uh, but none, none, none that are really poisonous. Not really poisonous. The only one that uh, is to be worried about and steer clear of is the adder, which is which is slightly poisonous. Um, but um, they are all much more frightened of you than you are of them. Um, the difficulty is is far more difficult to see them than to actually be frightened by them. Um, you you almost never see them. Uh, we're very it depends. Lucky. We do have some adders here, and I, I creep up on them very carefully so I can catch a glimpse. But they they get they go away very very quickly. It depends where you live and what your experience is. The adders are the ones with a little V on the shape. That whereas the smooth snake and the grass snakes are, are really not very marked. But the adder has a definite V shape on it. But my aunt trod on one, so I can tell you that. It bit her and she ended up in hospital and long Wellingtons were the order of the day. So it does depend a bit on your experience of it. It, it won't kill you, but it's still not very pleasant. It's a bit bigger than a wasp. <laughs> okay, so, so, the, so the, the answer to my question is that whether they are dangerous or venomous or not, there are snakes in England. I mean... It could be possible that I leave my house, go to the woods and see a snake, and then I will have a heart attack because I have a real phobia to them, even even if they're not going to do anything. Well, I need to have a word with my husband uh, later. Yeah, but they're, only very, they're, they're only very friendly snakes. Absolutely. <laughs> very polite. And, and they're also slow worms, which are not snakes, so don't be too, uh, too worried. But it is unusual to be bitten. It just happened that my aunt was, and that it's in the shadow in the woods. So you just need to be careful where you're going um, and pay attention. Um, but they're they're generally not going to hurt you. But I'm sorry, it was probably ignorance on your husband's part that he <laughs> didn't know enough about English wildlife. Please don't leave him. We like you living here in England. <laughs> We, have, we of course, have plenty of snakes here, so I'm probably best not to comment on this. <laughs> I have to switch. I mean, if there's a snake on a TV show or movie, I need to change the channel or just, like, move away. I'm, I'm really sorry. Cancel like a... your holiday to Greece, then. No, I really <laughs> wanted to go to the beach. I've got a question from uh, Kim, uh, which I have to apologize. I didn't bring up before. Uh it's, I don't know whether it's a question that any of you are prepared to answer. I will ask the question anyway, and if not, uh, Kim can contact the uh, uh, campaign group. And it says, Ki uh, Kim says, in your opinion, the environmental surveyors laid the squares of roofing felled in the woods, presumably looking for insect life, etc. But why did they only lay them along the sides of the main track and nowhere else? The track sites are mostly rubble and stone anyway. Should they not have been laid led through the woodlands is this something that you can comment or if not we can defer him to the camping group yeah i think they were probably surveying for things like snakes uh, because snakes like going under these these sorts of uh, sorts of coverings because they're warm and they may have actually been putting them in the, roughly the right place because um where the snakes would be where the reptiles would be is actually in the clearing areas so more likely along the sides of tracks uh, than in than deep in the woods so actually, you know, those those bits of felt were probably designed to be in the sun so they would warm up and the reptiles would go underneath them because that's where they like to be. In fact, it's a good way of trying to trying to see um trying to see snakes is to put out a bit of tin or something, lift it up carefully every now and then, and you can get wonderful surprises depending on what you look at and depending how 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 happy you are about seeing snakes. They, uh, so they were looking for the snakes that, according to my husband, do not live in this country. <laughs> <laughs> he, he, probably got, he probably got it confused with Ireland because they did drive out the snakes from Ireland. So, <laughs> if one day I see a snake in the woods, you're gonna, uh, Julia, you're gonna hear me shouting all the way from Greece. You will. You will. Okay. 
<laughs> uh, I would like to, I think it's time that we wrap this up for tonight. I would like to thank everybody who has been watching this Q&A and also the uh, premiere of the Wandering Our Woods before. I would like to thank you for participating, sending your comments, your feedback, your question. Of course, a big, big thank you to Tony and Julian and Jill for being with us tonight. And there is one last thing I would like to do or to add is that uh, some of you may have not heard of Stop the Lockwood Clay Pit campaign um, group until today. You, you were not very familiar with what's going on with the uh, planning with the um upcoming planning application uh so if you are very new to this uh fear no because very very recently the bbc covered uh the latest with the uh clay pit uh application and the campaign group so the last thing i'm going to do tonight is i'm going to let the bbc tell you more about this and to all of you watching thank you very much dig a clay pit and build a landfill recycling plant in a woodland at Lockswood in West Sussex are being opposed by residents. Among them is the Genesis guitarist Mike Rutherford, who says it will lead to the destruction of countryside. But the site's owner says demand for bricks is growing and new rules on waste mean a greater need for recycling facilities. Sean Killick reports. It's 300 acres of woodland where locals enjoy using the public rights of way. Now the family company which owns it wants to dig pits to extract clay on around 5% of the site. A recycling unit would be built there to process construction and demolition materials, some of which would be used to refill the pits. The area restored with trees, landscaped walks and a fishing lake. But there's opposition, including from the Genesis musician Mike Rutherford, who's lived in Locksford for 40 years. I'm now here about the proposed development and Pellingshurst Wood for a clay pit site uh, which would destroy the countryside, the woodland. I'm told 42 HGV lorries will go past the day. For many years it'll happen. And the change locally would be just so unbelievably bad. There must be better sites which are more suitable than a tranquil, beautiful woods that's full of wildlife, you know, especially at a time when we need to fight for every inch of woodland to protect the environment and mitigate the effects of uh, climate change. The company says no more than a third of a football pitch size a year would be dug, mostly scrubland. There'd be no hazardous or black bag waste. The area is officially designated for clay extraction and is suitable for waste development. And lorries will access through an old estate road, which is not a public right of way. Whilst it is a 15 to 20 acre development, in terms of the mitigation measures being implemented, they have been implemented over 280 acres in effect, so that there is overall a biodiversity net gain. We're not taking something away, we're actually adding to what already exists. The company says increased future house building will create more demand for bricks, but residents say that doesn't warrant the impact of noise and lorries in the woodland. A planning application is expected to be submitted in the coming months. Sean Killick, BBC South Today, Locksford.